Uh, I went to bed early last night and woke up this morning and um, started reading stuff about um, the golf, which was like not what I had anticipated reading. I anticipated reading a... Is it like a Santa Claus thing or...? Procession. Uh, is it a kind of... Is there a selection box or anything? N nothing. Uh, um, no, Brooks Kepka won, but uh, it wasn't really what we expected. He had a seven-shot lead going into the final round of the US PGA Championship in New York, and it ended up as a two-shot win. Uh, so um, he kind of half-choked, as he quoted himself. Uh, it was very, very difficult. Uh, they were playing in really gusty winds uh, at Bethpage Black. Um, he played this PlayStation hole on the 10th, where he drove the ball... Uh, about 300 yards down the centre of the fairway, crushed it to a few feet, got a birdie. I think the gap then was about, I think the gap went to six, and then he proceeded to bogey 11, 12, 13, and 14. Right. Dustin Johnson birdied 15, and then this is on. There's just one shot in it, and you're thinking, the whole Brooks Kepka narrative is now being challenged, uh, the one that Owen uh, uh, put so eloquently on, on Thursday morning. Not sure about eloquently. Um, well, I'm... I'm feeling good. Um, so um, it was uh, really exciting. Uh, the 16th is a very, very hard, long par four. Dustin Johnson crushes it down the fairway, and then he messes his approach. He overcooks his approach. He puts it in the rough, uh, and uh, his momentum just slips away. So he, he had it. To, uh, he had Brooks under pressure, and he couldn't avoid the leaderboards at Bethpage Black. They were like right, right in front of you. He had him under pressure. He had it to a shot, and then he bogeyed 16 and 17. So he choked too. Mm. Choked more than Brooks. Right. And it's not the first time Dustin Johnson, who was the world number one, now Brooks is the world number one this morning, um, has uh, had a difficult finish to a major championship. He's only won one of them. And uh, Brooks then, I think, is seeing that, knowing that his wobble is not going to be punished, uh, finished the job, finished it out. Look, it was very difficult out there. Um, but the courses Brooks has won on have been generally quite kind of those target golf courses. Aaron Hills, he won a major, Bella Reeve. Now best page, Chinnacock Hills is a windy course, but um, this is supposed to be the first time that, he, that was, he was really challenged, and uh, for a while, for half an hour or for an hour, he was struggling. Uh, you come out the other side of it, unlike Greg Norman? Does that mean well, that, that, that like, you know, you know? He did it. Look, I'm not trying to take away from his victory, and there's, there's so many things that have... That, 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 that he's the first ever player in the history of the game to defend both the US Open and the PGA at the same time, uh, or at all. Uh, the seventh player only to win multiple titles of the PGA and US Open. Um, his fourth victory in the last eight majors. Yeah, he's insane. not even he's not even thirty yet. Rory is thirty, so he's the youngest player now with four majors in the locker. Um, world number one, as we said. Uh, the stats uh, he led in greens hit over the week. Uh, he was third in driving distance, which I think we were saying was really important at Beth Page. Um, and where, do, where, do, where does it end now for Brooks Koepka? As Alan Shipnuck quotes, uh, you know, he's, he's, he's got one of these, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, something like, uh, like almost like a, that he's robotic or whatever, you know. So, um, yeah, it's, 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 it's pretty special. I don't know, like the, the one thing you do notice whenever you're watching Brooks Koepka, especially on, on Saturday night, is whoever his playing partner may be, playing partner addresses their second shot and you're like, who is that person in the distance? And it's Brooks Koepka who's like 50 yards ahead of them at all, point, at all times. And that is one of the things that sets them apart from the crowd. But it's not the only thing, obviously. I think the only person in world golf at the moment who can keep up with Brooks Koepka in terms of the charge towards greatness is Jordan Spieth. And the only reason for that is because of Jordan Spieth's age. He's 25 years old, Brooks Koepka is 29. I think of when it comes to DJ, when it comes to Rory, when it comes to Brooks Koepka, Brooks Koepka is clearly the best golfer of this. And he is clearly the man to lead the charge to be uh, the, the best golfer in the post-Tiger era. As I say, though, if Jordan Speed somehow manages to get back to the level he was at when he first stormed onto the scene, the 2016-esque Jordan Speed, then we might have a, a contest on our hands. Other than that, and I'm not trying to be dramatic here, I think Brooks Kepka is by far the most impressive golfer we could, we, we're seeing at the moment. At the moment, yes. A trackman optimized killer. I was looking for the, uh, the phrase in Alan Chip Chipnook's post about uh, Brooks Kepka. Um, Look, he's the 29th player to win four more majors. Phil Mickelson didn't win a major until he was 33. Right. So, and Phil Mickelson, I think, is probably the second best player of this generation. Um, we wait and see. I, I, I'm, the jury for me is a little bit out on Brooks Koepka uh, re re regarding him being a game changer. I would have felt that Spieth was the game changer ahead of McElroy. I suppose what it does say is McElroy, once again, a nice, tidy top 10, but... Um, 
you can you can get a top ten by really challenging and then fading, or you can get a top ten by kind of just finishing in the top ten. Yeah, and uh, like when I went to bed, they were himself and Larry. Well, I was pleasantly surprised they finished in the top ten because obviously the wind started to blow and picked up in the afternoon because they were yeah. tied twenty second. Um, I was like, ah, but like, that's unfortunate for them, you know. Yeah, fifteen top twenty may uh, fifteen top twenties in major since the twenty fourteen U.S. Open for Brooks Kepka. That is somebody who's just. Uh, tunnel vision about uh, focusing for these things, and I think I think did he not have the, the Jack Nicholas style quote that it's easier for me to play in these tournaments when I know that half the field don't have it in their heads or in their ability yeah. to win it, and I do. Um, so he might get a bit of stick for not being the most, um, you know, effervescent or uh, you know, um, you could call these. He's a bit dull. Yeah. Yeah, he's a bit robotic. Owen loves him. Owen, Owen is, is, is on he the really is, he, is it really the, the hallmark of a dull golfer to go out before a tournament and say, most of this field is going to bottle it? Is that, is that the hallmark of a, dull, of a dull golfer? Why did you fall in love with him? Because of that, because of his cockiness, because of his ability to go out and say, I can whittle this down to maybe three or four people who are going to challenge me this weekend. That's like a boxer talking up before a fight. Like, that is not a dull character. The dull thing is thrown around about Brooks Kepka because he's a golfer, because he uh, comes from, I, I, I don't know, a background which, which may kind even, of... Even golfers him think he's dull, right? That's the, that's the issue. Who said that? All of the golf media. Have they all said that? I, I, like, I'm not a, sure, I'm not a, sure a track, where... A trackman optimised uh, killer. Well, I mean, uh, if there was an actual trackman optimized killer playing uh, at the on the golf course at the weekend, I would have watched that sort of stuff because it, that is. Uh, well, I'm not. I'm not going to be seeking. I, I, a, I think that's a statement on his on his uh, golfing ability rather than the man himself. Like, I'm I'm not sure where this whole dull thing comes from. Like, he's. Well, I'm not going to be sitting down and with a with a cup of coffee or hot chocolate and like like seeking out the Brooks Koepka interview. Yeah, I'll certainly pick him more than Jordan Spieth or Justin Thomas, and uh, I'll do, I'll, I'll, certainly more than Dustin Johnson. Probably, like in certain ways, more than Rory McIlroy. To be honest, I would listen. I would listen to Brooks Koepka talk more than pretty much every other golfer. Which, to be fair, is more of a statement on golf than it is on Brooks Koepka. Yeah, that's kind of that's what a battery a little bit. Um, but what, like, if what, golf what? media are calling him dull, I, I don't think that's actually true. No, but. It, <laughs> Like he, he's not savvy, you know. He's he is uh, machine like. He is like when you master the Tiger Woods 2006 uh, PJ Tour PlayStation. When you're hitting at 350 yards, and it gets a bit boring. And you're hitting at 350 yards. You're hitting it to true feet, and you're putting it in the hole. That's the way he's playing golf. It is re- extremely impressive. You cannot argue against that. I'm just saying that. Uh, when he was playing in the wind yesterday, when he was under real pressure, when he, when it was not target, you know. Uh, machine Terminator Golf, he, he, he found it a little bit difficult. And I'm just saying in the annals of greatness, the Jacks, the Tigers, there's a little bit of a way to go. This guy was not smashing it up at 21 or 22. He was on the European Challenge Tour. He's done extremely well. But Harrington won three majors in the space of, what, 18 months? And sometimes golfers go through these streaks where they have brilliant spells. Yeah. Uh, will it happen in his 30s? I don't know. He could get injured. He might run off the ball. Uh, his putting might go to pieces. We don't know, but at the moment it's great. But just it, like I'm not really seeing in like because in the way he speaks or the way he talks, um, you know, something you know, like a story of great interest. I'm seeing a guy who probably feels he doesn't get enough respect, which I would agree with, and he channels that positively into the way he plays, which is I'm going to show you all, I'm going to crush you, and I'm doing that. Well, he's right to a certain extent in terms of not getting the respect. I mean, you spoke about the Brandel Chambly thing last week. Chambly last night went back on his words and said, I was wrong. He's starting to get that respect all of a sudden. The reason why I think his longevity might actually endure is because he actually doesn't like golf as much as the likes of Jordan Spieth and Justin Thomas and Rory McIlroy. He's not obsessed with the sport. He doesn't like to play it in the offseason and not that many golfers do, he's not going to be the person who kind of pours over his game now to try and get to the next level. He's just going to rock up to the next major and contend again. And then at the next major, guess what? He's going to contend again. And if you call that boring, fair enough. I call this greatness and a pure level of consistency. Brooks Kepka is going nowhere. Well, let's go to uh, Nathan Murphy who joins us to talk about what happened in the golf last night. Nathan, you tweeted, your tweet last night at the end said that Dustin Johnson played the best golf of the day but uh, damaged his reputation. Uh, here it is. Uh, DJ plays the best golf of the day and it still ends up being a terrible day for his reputation. Luckily the US Open is at Pebble Beach where he's a few wins and absolutely no bad memories from. So we'll talk about the bad memories in a minute, but um, how did he damage his reputation? Well, yet again putting himself into a position to contend for a major championship and the moment it flipped and actually he realised he was in contention, he lost it. He started missing putts. Like the conditions yesterday were 
easily the most difficult of the week. And he played brilliant golf when he was too far behind Kepka to really feel like he had a chance of winning the tournament. The second he moves within one, when Kepka has these four bogeys in a row, that's when it all goes horribly wrong. And listen, these things can happen. Maybe he had pushed himself for so long, for three, four hours, he just ran out of a bit of energy. But there's just such a body of evidence now that Dustin Johnson has a major issue with the majors. You look at Brooks Kepka, who was sort of seen three years ago as Dustin Johnson light. They were best mates, but Johnson was the massive success story. Kepka had, what, one PGA Tour win at that stage, not even a major championship victory at that stage. And Dustin Johnson has won on the PGA Tour every single year for well over a decade, yet still has just one major championship. And he has been in contention for half a dozen at this stage, from Pebble Beach going all the way back to when Gray McDowell won when he absolutely blew up in the final round. I remember being at Royal St. George, and I, I would have given him a free pass on a lot of these up to a couple of years ago. Everybody can have difficulties trying to win their first major at Pebble Beach. At Royal St. George, he's standing middle of the 14th fairway. He is looking to put some pressure on Darren Clark, and he skies the shot out of bounds. Again, I would have given him a free pass at the time, thinking, well, he went for it. He, you know, he was willing to lose the major. He was willing to go and try and put that pressure on. But this not, has happened consistently now. Are you not being a bit harsh? Because this would have been history. Nobody had ever come back from, nobody had ever blown a seven-stroke lead, nobody had ever obviously come back from a, a seven-shot deficit. Like, was it not great to get back into contention from there to at least make this tournament interesting? No, but it's, it's much like Rory McIlroy into a top ten. There was no great pressure on him early in that round. Nobody expected him to do anything. So it wasn't as though he was sleeping on a lead going okay, what am I going to do tomorrow? He wasn't even playing in the final pairing alongside Brooks Kepke. He was on a shot to nothing yesterday, and he went out comfortable, relaxed, not having to think about things, and played outstanding golf. But the second the pressure came on, the second he looked at that leaderboard and spotted he was within a shot of Brooks Kepke, his form dipped dramatically. And you can only assume that that had to be because of the pressure, because of something in his mentality where... For whatever reason, he cannot cope in major championships. It's not a problem in regular PGA Tour events. He does it time and time again. Though he did have a massive blow-up uh, just a couple of months ago in a regular PGA Tour event. But generally, he sees those out quite easily. But you know, people look at Dustin Johnson and he's accused of being a bit dumb at times. That There was a sense, certainly a couple of years ago, he was almost too dumb to feel pressure. It, that's clearly not the case. <laughs> It would have been interesting to see what would have happened even if Johnson was one shot closer to Kepka going down 18 because he has that safety then of pitching out of the rough uh, on the left after his poor enough tee shot in the 18th. What do you think would have happened, say in an alternate reality, had uh, Johnson just been one shot closer to Brooks Kepka just to really put, the, put him under the pump? Uh, I don't know because the whole dynamic of the day changes and maybe part of the reason for Brooks Kepka having those four bogeys in a row and allowing Dustin Johnson back into it was that he was too relaxed he, you know, for the back nine of a major championship that he was in cruise control for so long that when he needed to up his game it just wasn't there. Maybe if that pressure comes on earlier from Dustin Johnson he is able to respond. So I think it's impossible to know whether or not it would have been easier for Dustin Johnson to seal the deal. Unfortunately for Dustin Johnson, there is just this huge body of evidence that for a player who's been the dominant player on the PGA Tour for the last 10 years in terms of regular season events, to still just have one major to have been outplayed now by McElroy, by Spieth, by Kepka, all these guys have flown past them. He's 34 years old at this point, and I hate to bring it back to age again, but like I was saying earlier on, that it definitely seems to me that Spieth is the only person you can put into the conversation with Brooks Kepka to be the number one from this generation of golfers. Like, uh, you, you can't really box it all off at this point. Anything could happen over the next two years. Like, Rory's only going to be 33 in three years' time, for example. Anything can happen. But at this time, it does seem that the two of them are kind of your best shot at the, the number one golfer from this generation. Well, like, are you including McElroy in that generation? Yes, you yes. have to, because himself and Kepka are the same age. Yeah. They both have four majors. It'll simply be decided on who gets the most majors. Jordan Spieth has many years on them. He's five years younger, so he has a lot more time. He's got 20 more majors automatically to be the best player of the generation. But if Kepka continues at this pace, he's won his four majors quicker than anybody's ever won four majors after winning the first. He's just unstoppable. And he's probably redefined the way a lot of players are going to look at professional golf. I don't think it's necessarily a good thing for the game 
the way Brooks Kepka goes about it, where he doesn't care about the regular events. His entire focus is on these four majors. And in this new calendar, the four majors happen over four months. What happens in golf for the next eight months? And that's where, I guess, if Brooks Kepka wants to be a superstar and maybe he doesn't, maybe he just wants a, a little bit of fame and a little bit of respect. But if you're not turning up and delivering and you're not playing a huge amount of events and in those events you're not that bothered for eight months of the year, it's very hard for the general public to grow an attachment. Whereas McElroy's there week in, week out playing. Spieth is there week in, week out. We see their flaws. We see Jordan Spieth going through a dip in form right now. Whereas with Kepka, even if he's not performing in PGA Tour events, everyone assumes when it comes round to the majors, it's going to happen for him. But it's clearly working. He's doing the right thing. And I'd be interested to see if McElroy learns any lessons from what Kepka's doing. McElroy in his post-round press conference was talking about how it's going to be different for Kepka now that, well, weirdly, even though he's won the three before this, it's only today it feels like the world has woken up to the genius of Brooks Kepka and look at him in a totally different way. And he's going to be the favorite probably for every major for the next 18 months, two years, that suddenly there's going to be a lot more demands on Kepka. McElroy talks about this a lot, that this was the biggest difficulty he had when he started winning majors, the ability to say no, that time was his most precious commodity. But to flip that, McElroy has a lot of commercial deals. One of the most interesting things about Bruce Kepka is he doesn't. He has his Nike apparel deal. But since Nike gave up making clubs, he never signed a new club deal. Now, he could be making four or five million quid a year through his club deal, but he has a mix in his bag. He uses a tailor-made driver. He uses tightless wedges, and he likes that freedom, it seems. And also, the talk seems to be that he also likes his days off. So if you sign a club deal, you're going to be working 14, 15 days a year on the corporate side of things. And actually, Kepka doesn't really fancy that. Yeah, I mean, maybe, maybe that's exactly the right thing for him to do, and he can make money... You know, when he's finished, and it looks like he's not going to be short uh, a euro or two uh, as things move on. Or he, here's a wild conspiracy theory, Nathan. Maybe when you can choose your own clubs, they're actually better clubs. Well, quite possibly. <laughs> I don't think there's any doubt about that, that if, if you had the freedom to find the best of whatever it is at any time. But these are the things you weigh, weigh up as a professional golfer. Can I? Uh, did nobody think that like it's okay to have a golfer endorse several different brands for several different things? Like... If I'm tailor-made and he's using my driver, I'm like, mm. I don't care that he's not using my irons. But if he's using my driver and he's booming that ball that far, I'm getting him on board and I'm saying, you use whatever irons you want, buddy, but we're going to use you for four days a year or six days a year and we'll give you a quarter or a half of the money or maybe three quarters of the money. Like, uh, the golf marketing needs to catch up with what the players Be a bit more open-minded. A little bit, you know, I mean. Uh, a mix in your bag isn't the worst thing, is it? Um, just the point about McElroy learning stuff from him. The only thing is, McElroy is a streaky golfer. He needs to play himself into form, right? It's like, is that not generally? Uh, there are a couple of majors that he's won where he's come out of a couple, few weeks off and just blitz the field, though. I suppose. Yeah, well, the, mo the most recent spell, which is five years ago, nearly now, when he wins the Open, the Bridgestone Invitational, and the US PGA in the space of four weeks, he suddenly has this hot streak where the putter works and he's absolutely unstoppable. But he had that at the start of this year. He won the Players' Championship. He finished top 10 week in, week out. Unfortunately, it seems that the hangover of Augusta has carried on since. It was going to be interesting to see, could he sort of park Augusta to one side and go, do you know what? I've been the best golfer in the world for the last three months. Let's just continue with that. Let's just forget about the pressure and the stress and the strains of going for the career grand slam. But it seems as though, actually, Augusta took a lot out of him in terms of his confidence. He just doesn't seem to have the same spark he had a couple of months beforehand. And that's going to be a worry for him because this is going to continue consistently for McElroy every single year ahead of Augusta. It's going yeah. to be three months of chat. Like Jordan Speed this week, remember, was heading into the weekend in second place, going for a career grand slam himself if he wins the USPGA. Nobody even really spoke about it. Whereas McElroy, because of the calendar and Augusta been first up and the Masters been such a special event, is going to have to deal with this consistently. 